past 13 years, Gaylord Torrance has been the Fred and Virginia Farrell Senior Curator of the American Indian Art at the Nelson Adkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. He is also a Professor Emeritus of Fine Arts at Drake University. Torrance received his MFA in painting from Michigan State University and began his career as a practicing artist and teacher. He headed the studio drawing program at Drake for 32 years prior to coming to the Nelson Atkins. During this period, he conducted research on Native American art in museums throughout the North America and Europe. He initiated one of the few university programs of North American Indian art history in the nation and began work as an independent curator. His exhibitions and publications include The Plains Indians, Artists of Earth and Sky, originating at the Musée uh, du Quai Bronley in Paris in 2014, traveling to Kansas City and closing at the Museum at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in May of this year. He also wrote uh, The American Indian Parflesh, a tradition of abstract painting, now regarded as a landmark study in the field of American Indian art history. Torrance is currently working on a catalog of the Nelson Atkins Collection of American Indian Art. Today, he will present Plains Indian Tobacco Bags Containers for the Sacred. Help me welcome Gaylord Torrance. Thank you, Dwayne. Can you hear me? I drift off. Um, raise your hand. Do, are you shaking? Can you not hear me? How's that? All right. Good. Thank you. Um, uh, first, uh, I'd like to join my colleagues, David and Emma, in thanking Dr. King and everyone here at the Gilcrease. John Stewart for their hospitality, good spirit, their, their great help with everything that we're doing with this project. And I, I'd like to begin. Uh, first of all, I don't know what I'm, I don't know if I'm going to read this or talk it. Uh, we've been uh, David and I have been talking about the, the pros and cons of this um, last night and then again today. And I, I normally don't read papers, but I've actually written one out. Um, and we'll see how it goes. And I may just stop at a certain point and simply talk about what it is I'm here to talk about, Plains Indian tobacco bags. Um, so it's this, the, the tobacco bags developed as an important aesthetic form in 19th century Plains culture. And um, so I, I find myself here this morning listening to Dr. West eloquent introduction um, about objects and about what they mean and whether really how we see them as works of art. And I was reminded of an experience um, actually a little over 30 years ago. It was my first real encounter with the Native American community. And up until that time, all of my work had been in museum storage collections or um, moving through the literature uh, and as deeply as I possibly could. And this was my first experience in actually talking to uh, Native peoples who were engaged with uh, the kinds of objects that I was there to study. I was talking to an elder. He was a bundle keeper, religious leader, clan leader. And uh, at my request, he had brought out a beautiful, spoon for me to see and um, it was a mecca. I would call it a magnificent piece of woodland sculpture. It was, it had a, a wonderfully elegant bowl that moved into the handle of a horse and a horse's head and I was looking at it and I, I pondering and I said to him does, do you think this dates 1865 or 1895? And he looked at me for what seemed like a long period of time, 
And he basically said, why would I possibly care? <laughs> and then he, he went on in our conversation to talk about the fact that wood, among traditional Meskwaki, is a sacred material from which the spoon is made. He talked about the ceremonies in which this kind of object was used. He talked about the history of this object in terms of um, passing down through his family and the numbers of people that had used this object in religious feasts to eat consecrated food. And as he spoke, I realized what he was bringing forward were all of these additional layers of meaning by which he valued this object. And it was very, very different from a kind of classical art historical point of view that um, uh, I was bringing to this study. And that encounter was transformative for me. It, it changed the way I began to look at things. And basically from that time on, I was always aware that no matter how focused I might be in the beauty of an object and the aesthetic accomplishment and the expressive power that was contained in something, um, that this thing had a historical meaning, it had a cultural presence and significance, and that those elements are never out of sight of the beauty of the work. So it really, as we try to look at these things and understand them, we have to look at them in a, in a multiplicity of ways. We look at them um, uh, recognizing the complexity of what it is that we're trying to understand. And that's, um, uh, which brings me to talking about tobacco bags with you today. The ritual use of tobacco by Native peoples was common throughout much of North America from pre-contact times. And within many nations and with individuals remains in practice today. Among the Plains Indians, pipe ceremonial, ceremonialism was central to the culture and highly developed. Pipes and stems and the tobacco bags that accompanied them were often conceived and executed as significant and meaningful works of art. The prototypical containers for tobacco developed in woodlands cultures to the east, the earliest believed to have been constructed from the whole skins of animals. And these, together with sewn native leather bags embellished with porcupine quill work and later bead work, evolved into the classic plains tobacco bag or pipe bag as they are sometimes known, which reached its greatest development during the 19th century. These objects were produced by women artists and uh, Arthur Amiot is always quick to point out that about 70% of the plains art that exists today in museums was created by women, which is something that uh, in mainstream culture we often forget. Uh, these these bags, or many of them, um, also served as containers for men's smoking materials. So the pipe, the stem, and tamper, sometimes matches or fire making equipment, all of these things were stored uh, in many bags except for those in the southern plains where uh, bags were more delicately constructed and reserved for tobacco alone. But in their final manifestation, bags were relatively long and narrow in proportion. They were typically divided into three or four vertical sections, um, an upper sleeve, a beaded or porcupine quilt, an embroidered central panel, uh, sometimes with a quill wrapped or uh, slatted element below, and then a long fringe. Uh, and all of these things varied enormously over time, depending on the nation in which they were produced and the time period. And am I, is there a photograph of Stuart Cullen behind me? It has nothing to do with my talk, but is he wearing spats? Did you notice that? Here we are, okay. The examination of tobacco bags as an artistic expression, um, it, it serves an interesting purpose apart from the bag, and that is that it focuses upon the dynamic nature of Plains art and culture. Because tobacco bags appear so frequently in late 19th century photographs, and so many from the period appear in museums today, it's easy to slip into the notion 
that bags of this kind, not this kind, but a later kind, were uh, produced throughout the history of the culture, really without a lot of, without a lot of change. Um, that's not at all the case. As we look at the bags over a period of about 100 years, which we'll do, you'll see shifting stages of artistic development, and you'll also see that artistic forms were not only, uh, not only artistic forms were evolving within the culture, but also patterns of use and meaning. At the beginning of the 19th century, beaded or porcupine quill tobacco bags were rarely seen, and to my knowledge, none have been collected. They began to appear as a distinct form um, in the early decades of the century, and by the last half, and particularly excuse me, during the final third, such bags have developed as a common feature of men's formal dress and a symbol of leadership. Then shortly after the turn of the 20th century, at what might be considered the height of the development, the form, tobacco bags seemingly fell into disuse and all but disappeared. There are four types of Woodlands bags that are known to have served as containers for tobacco during the 18th century and before. And these likely <coughs> formed the basis for the development of Plains Indian bags. Some are cited in early narratives and all are clearly antecedents in form and style. And I should mention here that I'm going to exclude the kind of small, squarish bags of black buckskin that were worn bandolier fashion. These may have been used as containers of tobacco as well, but they're not part of what we're looking at today. In her detailed study on quill drawstring tobacco bags from the northeastern woodlands, Sylvia Kaspricki cites three accounts by French missionaries that are probably the earliest references to tobacco bags in North America. These date from the early to late 1600s, and they are from French missionaries. Um, one narrative describes leather pouches exquisitely worked and porcupine quills for tobacco. Another states that, quote, the more considerable savages carry at their backs with much gravity a little bag wherein is their calumet or pipe, their tobacco, their steel to strike fires and other trifles. Another speaks of belt worn pouches of tobacco and for, for tobacco and pipes made from the complete skin of a young otter, beaver or fox, which were undecorated except for some beadwork by the women, and other tobacco pouches made of buckskin and neatly sewn with colors. Clearly the creation of special containers for tobacco as the physical embodiment of prayer was in place at the time of first contact and like many woodlands, religious concepts and artistic forms extended to developing plains cultures. The first of these early bags to be considered are the animal skin bags made from the whole skins of animals, mammals, and birds. And this is a beautiful example here. They must have been an ancient type produced throughout the woodlands and are perhaps the oldest of all containers. Uh, they are really the practical outcome of a hunting culture and the spiritual association with various animals embodied in the transformed skins is self-evident and compelling. The creature's pelts were usually decorated with some combination of quill work, beadwork, and paint together with delicate suspensions of various materials. And the addition of these decorative elements affected a remarkable transformation. Rather than disguising the animal, its lifelike presence was heightened, and the resulting image was that of a powerful spirit being, honored and enhanced by splendid ornamentation. The skins of these spirit helpers may also have been used to hold medicines and other sacred materials. And the objects, and this is difficult to understand looking at a photograph like this, but the objects retained a living presence. Uh, within their use. And there are some wonderful photographs taken at the turn of the century of religious practitioners holding these bags that are filled out with medicines and tobaccos. The heads fall forward and look, look outward. And the objects look as though they are alive. And in one of my early conversations with uh, this same Meskwaki person that I mentioned earlier, he talked about uh, the ceremony in 
which bundles were unwrapped on an annual basis and the otter skin bags were taken out and honored. And the definition of, not the definition, but his description of the ceremony was to let them stretch out. Um, which was another reminder of how impossible it is to really understand the full dimension of Native American art and culture without knowing language deeply. And we, we, English was his second language. I didn't speak Meskwaki. We, interesting things came out of that. But almost always when a description was given to identify something, it, it endowed this object, whatever it, whatever it was, with another layer of meaning. The most animal skin bags that are found in collections today are made from otters, and they are mostly documented as being associated with the Medevi one, or the Grand Medicine Society, which was a complex religious society centered in the western Great Lakes and extending to the prairie tribes. Uh, in appearance, otter bags carried by first-degree initiates of the Mide religion are indistinguishable from those that are cited as tobaccos for, um, uh, as containers for tobacco and various medicines. But there is considerable evidence, uh, beginning with this object associated with Lewis and Clark, that indicates that animal skin bags were used completely apart from the Mide religion, and this is seen on, uh, in the arts of the later Plains people. This bag um, is the earliest documented tobacco bag that we know. It is believed to have been presented. It's one of the nine objects presented to Lewis and Clark during their transcontinental journey. And it was made from the skin of an adult animal and then beautifully embroidered with porcupine quill embroidery uh, in a number of techniques on the paws and underside of the tail. Um, when the piece arrived at the Peabody Museum at Harvard in 1899, it was accompanied with an old paper label from the Peel Museum stating tobacco bag sent to Captains Lewis and Clark by the Sock Nation. So the tag is ambiguous, citing two different tribes, because the spelling of the two groups is inconsistent in the various records during the period, and the bag's origin therefore remains somewhat in question. It's known that Lewis and Clark did not meet with the Sauk on their expedition, but even so, the bag could have been sent through an intermediate group, in this case, the Sioux. This is questionable, however, because the two nations were mortal enemies with each other, and you can't imagine, really, a Sauk bag traveling through um, Sioux or Dakota hands to Lewis and Clark, but we don't know. Whatever its origin, whatever its tribe, and, and all the groups from this area created bags like this, its use is clearly established. And it was undoubtedly accompanied with a very, very fine pipe worthy of this splendid bag, probably one of those associated with Lewis and Clark in the, in the collection of the Peabody Museum today. The second type of bag used for tobacco is a small drawstring pouch. Uh, there are seven of these that are known. They were collected in the Northeast. Kaspriki illustrates these in her study and verifies one as having served as a tobacco bag. We know this from a mercenary soldier, one Lieutenant Wilhelm Duroy, who fought with, for the British during the American Revolution. And he sent a group of artifacts back to his brother, 